We'll begin this evening's program with the singing of the national anthem and Hatikva by our very own cantor, Jackie Raffi. Please rise. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the Israel has been on our hearts and been weighing on our minds and our souls since we woke up to the horrifying news of October 7th. And that Shabbat HaShchorah has profoundly changed us to the core. And the question, the question is, where do we go with all of our feelings and all of our emotion? How do we live like this? And it makes VBS and communities like us all the more important so that we can engage in these crucial conversations and bring thought leaders into our community so we can learn together and so that we can hold each other and so that we can live together as community, as a people, as a family. Ido Aharoni Aronoff is an Israeli diplomat, writer, lecturer, and consultant. He has served as a member of the Board of Governors of Tel Aviv University since 2015 and a visiting lecturer 
at the university's Collar School of Management since 2018. He's a co-founder of the Israel-based consultancy Emerson Rigby, co-founder and principal of British-Israeli investment company EA2K, and a member of the International Advisory Council of APCO Worldwide, value-based MasterCard and Libra Group. Aroni has served as a global distinguished professor for international relations at New York University's Graduate School of Arts and Science from 2016 to 2022. He's a member of the board of directors of the World Jewish Sports Museum in Israel and is the host of Tel Aviv University Unbound, the official English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. He is a co-founder of a global ambassador for the Genius 100 Visions community, chairman of the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy and global ambassador for Maccabi World Union. Aharoni is a 25-year veteran of Israel's foreign service. His public diplomacy specialist, founder of the Brand Israel Program, a well-known nation branding practitioner. Aroni has been Israel's longest serving Consul General in New York and the Tri-State area to date. He held that position with the rank of Ambassador for six years from 2010 to 2016, overseeing the operations of Israel's largest diplomatic mission worldwide. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to welcome to Valley Beth Shalom, Ido Aharoni Aronoff. Thank you, Rabbi Lebovich, for this kind introduction, and uh, thank you for uh, being such a great leader of this community and for embracing so strongly and so firmly uh, Zionism, which is something that is more important than ever. For me, coming to Los Angeles is always like coming back home because I lived here, my wife was born and raised here, I even had my wedding reception five minutes from here, and I have about this entire section of the audience as my family. <laughs> um, and so, and, and also my assist, assistant's family is here, her sister is here, and her cousins, and, and their cousins. So I think I basically, 50% of the room is related to me. <laughs> um, so it really feels like home. And I also would like to acknowledge the Howard family uh, is also like family to me. Uh, Ellen Howard has been my dentist, and remember, I live in Israel, and his practice is on Ventura Boulevard, <laughs> yet he's been my dentist since the early 1990s, and, uh, and I'm, I think <laughs> his specialty is cosmetic dentistry, so I smile a lot. Um, you know... I wanted the next 20 minutes to share with you some insights and perspective of someone who is in, in Israel right now, whose son is in the front lines as a reservist, and I get to talk to my son once a day, most days, and, um, and I think I have a pretty good understanding of what's happening. I'm also, since October 7th, I dropped everything, and I'm 100%, and Don can tell you, I'm volunteering. I'm helping the families of the hostages mostly, but I'm also involved with all sorts of initiatives. Um, and so I'm deeply involved with what was happening. Now, about a year ago, I received an invitation from the Jewish National Fund to speak at their national conference in Denver. And I know where's Lou. Lou is here. He's going to be there um, in, uh, in the end of the month in, in Denver. And... So I said to my assistant, Dawn, I said to her, you know, I'm going to be in the States anyhow. I think I can bring more value in the United States, sharing with people, first of all, insights from Israel, but more importantly, you know, some of the, um, you know, calls to action, almost. And... And so let's see what happens if we'll just let people know that I'm going to be available. And the next thing you know, we were inundated with requests from all sorts of organizations, from American Friends of Tel Aviv University to Bet HaLochem, who's represented here by my dear friend Revital, stand up. She's representing an organization that takes care of the injured soldiers. And just to remind you, just on October 7th alone, we had over 3,000 injured people 
uh, Soroka Hospital in Beersheba had to deal with 700 people in the ER while the hospital was in full capacity that Saturday morning. So the demand is high, the system is in full capacity even before the war. So let alone what's happening now when we have thousands, thousands of more people injured um, that we have to take care of as a, system, as a system. So now the end result is 27 days on the road, eight different cities, 26 events like this. And so that's my contribution to the war effort. And so I'm very, very pleased for this opportunity to be here and to address this community, which was, also happens to be the first community I ever addressed as a diplomat in North America. My first public speech was right here, uh, not in this room, it was a different room, um, in September of 1994, Rabbi Schulweis uh, uh, of blessed memory. So several observations. Some of them may sound counterintuitive to you. All right? The first is, the year is not 1948. Don't let Israeli politicians fool you. This is not existential. Just as 9-11 did not, did not destroy the United States, 10-7 will not destroy the state of Israel. I'll tell you more than that. Even if the Iranian will have it their way, and they will be able to successfully impose a multi-front war against Israel, they will include Hezbollah from the north, and Hamas from the south, and pro-Iranian militia from Syria, and pro-Hamas groups from the West Bank, and even dormant cells of Arab Israelis within Israel. We'll talk in a second about why the Arabs are actually not supporting Hamas. Even if that happens, if the, Palestinians, if the Iranians get to live their fantasy, even that will not destroy the state of Israel. Now, why do I say that? I say that for two reasons. The first is, as a son of a person, a father, who fought the 1948 War of Independence, my father was injured twice and was sent to the front lines shortly thereafter because they didn't have the luxury of waiting until he's fully recovered. To say that 19... 48, we're living in 1948, is to disrespect the generation of 1948. In 1948, we had absolutely nothing. Israel did not have an army. We did not have an ammunition. We did not have weapons. We did not have the support. Not the United States, not the Soviet Union, certainly not Britain. The only people that supported us were Jews, in particular American Jews. And I can tell you, there would not be a state of Israel if not for the support of American Jews. And remember, it was not all American Jews. Only 17%, one seven, of American Jews identified as Zionists in the mid 1940s. And that was enough to make Israel happen. All right? So today, when Israeli politicians recklessly, recklessly, irresponsibly, standing in front of you, telling you that 2023 Israel is on the verge of extinction, it's unacceptable. Israel is one of the strongest countries in the world. According to international media, has the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Israel has one of the most robust economies in the world. Israel enjoys the support of most important countries in the world. We just had 412 members of the Congress voting in favor of Israel. Show me another issue. This particular American Congress can produce such a wall-to-wall -wall consensus. Israel enjoys the support of Germany, of England, of France, of Italy, of the most populous nation in the world, India. Unprecedented level 
of diplomatic support. We've never had such a firm diplomatic umbrella. I'll tell you more than that. Public opinion surveys indicate that there's a sharp rise in support for Israel among Americans from all walks of life. But the algorithm is able to convince us that the whole world is out there against us. It's not true. As a small, noisy minority that is expressing unacceptable views, it's, my, it's one of my insights that I'm going to share with you today, what to do with them. But, make no mistake, Israel is not facing extinction. It's true, we were badly surprised in the morning of October 7th. And that failure, which will be investigated, is a systematic, systemic failure. Both systematic and systemic. And it cost far too many lives and brought about the largest calamity that our people experienced since the Holocaust. No different in many ways that the surprise on 9-11 or the surprise in Pearl Harbor or the surprises that other nations experienced throughout their history. But just as 9-11 did not destroy the United States, 10-7 will not destroy Israel. Rest assured. I'll tell you more than that. I anticipate a period of tremendous growth in Israel once we're going to get out of this. And we'll talk in a second about what it means to get out of this, to put this behind us. Second insight. What you're seeing is not a war between Israel and Hamas. What you're seeing is an effort by Russia to undermine the United States. Russia, I will say in parenthesis, doesn't have a, st a chance, doesn't stand a chance to undermine the United States. Yet, they're trying. Why? I'll explain. During the years of the Cold War, the Cold War broke out the moment Winston Churchill described the Soviet Union and what's happening in the Soviet Union. He used the term the Iron Curtain in a famous speech that he gave in Westminster, Missouri. And the year was 1945. That was, you know, experts refer to that particular moment in time as the day the Cold War broke out. Now, during the Cold War, the world was divided between the pro-Soviet camp and the pro-American camp. For example, tiny Israel of the early 1950s had to make a choice. A lot of people don't know, but Israel had to make a choice. Are we going to be with the Soviets or with the Americans? It wasn't taken for granted that we're going to be pro-American. In fact, most Israeli generals in the army we're pro-Soviet because they were socialists and they didn't like American commercialism and American capitalism. They thought Stalin was a great promise for humanity. To the best of my knowledge, the decision was Ben-Gurion's decision. Why Ben-Gurion decided to go for the American orientation? We don't really know. I have a hunch is the fact that he understood that the American system allows the nurturing of creativity and the creation of knowledge, which is a key for human progress. And because Israel had no natural resources, no oil, no gold, the only thing Israel could produce was knowledge. And for, for him, the strategic partnership with the United States was the only natural option. Plus, don't forget, his wife was American. A lot of people don't know that. Paula Munvez lived in Brooklyn. He came to Brooklyn to court Paula Munvez. They got married in the City Hall in New York in 1918. A lot of people know that, that Israel's prime minister got married in New York. That's trivia. So once the Soviet Union collapses and the Cold War ends, 
And remember, the Cold War ends without us really knowing how the Soviet Union was an empty shell. There was nothing really there. Then the world becomes dominated by the United States. You may not see that as Americans, but the United States is the only country that matters in the world. And it's been like that since the late 1980s. And it's not because you're so lovely. It's not because the United States has the strongest army, and it does have the, strong, the strongest army. It's not because the United States is the wealthiest, and you are the wealthiest. It's because the United States is the country that produces all the knowledge that allows human progress. For example, COVID. Look at what happened during COVID. You know, I teach a class at the business school about branding. It's particular nation branding. How do you brand a nation? And I use the list of the top 100 strongest brand names in the world. About, I would say, 70, 75% of them are all American brands. The rest of the 25% split between China, Japan, Korea. You know, you have a few Swedish brands on the list. You will not find not even one Russian name. There has not been a Russian brand in the top 100 in the last 50 years. Now, it's not because there is no talent in Russia. There's great talent in Russia. It's because the Russian system doesn't allow creative people to express themselves. It doesn't know how to, cre how to nurture human creativity. This is all to say that Putin is adamant to bring to an end the era of American domination. Whereas American value system was the dominant value system in the world. Protecting democracies, advancing democracies, protecting liberties. Putin decided to try to put an end to it. Unfortunately, it was aided by some American presidents, not directly. Some American presidents that made horrible mistakes. For example, the decision to attack Iraq and not Iran after 9-11. Attacking Iraq while Iran, the real father of Al-Qaeda's ideology, is left out of the equation. Just imagine how easier things could have been if the United States had targeted correctly Iran and not Iraq post 9-11. Or the decision to backtrack on the red line that President Obama promised in Syria. Three months later, Putin invaded Crimea. And of course, the war between Russia and Ukraine. So Russia found a partner, Iran. Iran is acting out of weakness, not out of strength. There are 1.4 billion Muslims in the world. 85% of them are Sunnis. Only 15% of the Muslims are Shiites. Of the 15% Shiites, 75% live in Iran. So Iran is isolated within the Muslim world. I'll tell you more than that. Within the Shiite world, the second largest Shiite country, is Azerbaijan, which Iran hates. So even within the Shiite world, Iran is isolated. So Iran creates a coalition of the weak with Russia. It's the new axis of evil. Russia and Iran together, and sometimes Turkey, depends on the day. Russia and Iran, Using, by proxy, Islamism, it can be Hamas, it can be Hezbollah, it can be the Houthi in Yemen, it can be anybody. There is a long list. Go on United States Department of State website and you'll Google up the recognized terrorist organizations in the United States. You'll see there's a list of at least 30 different groups. All of them are Muslim. You will not find one Christian terrorist organization. 
or Jewish. All of them are Muslim. And the purpose is to put an end to the era of American dominance. In political science theory, this is called the theory of democratic peace. The Americans believe that democracies do not invade each other, democracies do not fight each other, and therefore democracy should be the preferred value system in the world. That's why, for example, President Biden, Biden refrained from meeting with Netanyahu for nine months because he viewed Netanyahu's steps as an attempt to undermine Israeli democracy, which is against the policy of the United States. And that's the story. It's not something that we did that brought about October 7th. It's what we stand for that brought about October 7th. You have to understand that. It's not a matter of policy. All the people that frame what happened within the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict have no idea what they're talking about. This is not about Palestine. This is not about nationalism. This is not about a solution to the Palestinian people. This is the work, incomprehensible display of brutality by an agent of chaos whose only purpose is to instill chaos. How do we know that? Because Hamas never showed any interest in the well-being of the Palestinian people. Hamas has no desire whatsoever to improve the lives of the Palestinian people. They were never about Palestinian people. So that's the second observation. What you're seeing is something that is a piece from a much larger puzzle that is being orchestrated by Russia, masterminded by Iran, and executed by Hamas and Hezbollah. Third observation. Usually when you look at public opinion, I adhere to the 102070 rule. The 10 stands for those who will never accept what we have to sell them. I call them the Noam Chomskys of the world. No matter what you do, you go to Oslo, he's against you. You go to war, he's certainly against you. No matter what you do, you can't win with them. And I use 10, it can be 5, it can be 7, 8%, it doesn't matter. But usually it's 10% in the Western world. Then you have 20%. The 20%, they buy whatever we sell them. Who are those 20%? You. But mostly Christians, good Christians in America, in Germany, but mostly in America. But then you have 70%. Who are those 70%? The vast majority of people, uninformed, uninterested, don't know much about the world. Usually the people that J Jimmy Kimmel is interviewing on Hollywood Boulevard. And I don't have to tell you what kind of answers he's getting from them, right? These are the people, these are the 70%. Now, historically, Israel, as well as the organized Jewish world, did the human thing, the natural thing. We responded to the source of agitation, and the agitation usually came from the 10%. So our entire advocacy efforts were directed at the people that no matter what we do or say, will never change their minds thus neglecting the 70% that represent our room to grow. These were the people that we actually needed to cultivate. That was the rationale behind Taglid, birthright. Let's bring people of, that are loosely connected to the community, bring them to Israel. And by the way, I must say, there's a lot of criticism against birthright, which I think is totally wrong. I don't know where we would have been today if not for birthright. Birthright, in fact, prevented a catastrophe in the Jewish community, in my view. And I think I know birthright a little bit. So for years, we neglected the 70%. <clears throat> then came the information revolution and information overload. What is information overload? 
The human brain was never designed to handle all those stimulations. The human brain was designed to allow us to survive in nature. Maybe two, three tasks that we can perform simultaneously. But what happens through those little devils, we're being inundated with digital stimulations hundreds of times every day. What does it do to our brain? Two things. The first is, of course, we're overwhelmed. When we're overwhelmed, the level of anxiety goes up. We see unprecedented number of suicides reported, even among youth, especially among girls. We see a sharp rise in the consumption of anti-anxiety medication, antidepressants, and so on and so forth. It's a direct result of information overload. And we see 2007, if there are any psychiatrists in the room, they can attest to it. 2007, the year the first smartphone was introduced, you begin to see the rise. 2007 is the year that historians will point to the year that changed the world. 2007, the first smartphone that messes with our minds. But the second thing that happens, which affects October 7 and the conversation around it, the second thing that happens, the first is the level of anxiety goes up and we tend to make more mistakes when we're anxious, right? Look at uh, Professor Russell Rickford from Cornell. We'll talk about him. But the second thing that happens is more severe. Our brain is beginning to crave for simple solutions to highly complex problems. We begin to crave simplicity in the face of growing complexity. In the annals of nations, it's known as the rise of populism. And in some countries, a new genre of populism, anti-state populism. What is anti-state populism? When the populist leader is accusing the very institutions of the state that he or she run as being the elite that is trying, trying to harm the people. Like an autoimmune disease. It happened here, it happened certainly in Israel, and it happened in other countries of the world. Anti-state populism. And the populist message fits this age of the tyranny of the algorithm. What is Brexit, if not a simple solution? And again, it doesn't matter where you stand on Brexit. You can be in favor, you can be against, but the, the idea that there's one cut solution to a highly complex problem is a product of information overload. And so you end up with people that see the world as a binary option of good versus evil. These are the two only options that exist in that simple world. So either you're in favor of free Palestine or not. And if you are in favor of free Palestine, it means that you're also supporting a whole other issues. This is known as intersectionality. And then identity politics kicks in, and if you happen to be black, then you're expected to do A, B, and C, and you happen to be gay, A, B, and C, and all of a sudden the Jews and Israel find themselves on the wrong side of all of the, all the issues. I want you to understand how insane this is. So Russell Rickford, do you know who he is? This is the weak-minded Cornell University professor who in the morning of October 7th stood in front of his students and said that the massacre made him feel exhilarated. He said, I'm exhilarated, I'm energized, he said to his students. So I looked him up. He's African American, he was raised by two Stanford University professor, professors, right? So this kid, this privileged kid who was raised in the Bay Area by two Stanford University professors, right? He is the oppressed in his binary world. And me, the Israeli diplomat, 
whose grandparents came from Yemen barefoot in 1912. And my grandmother was cleaning houses until she died. And my grandfather was a garbage man in the city of Tel Aviv. I'm white privilege. Look at me. And he is the oppre oppressor and I'm the oppressed. In their twisted mind. This is, my friends, a direct product of information overload. The inability to deal with complexity, lack of nuance. What is cancel culture if not of lack of nuance? I cannot deal with complex ideas. I want them to go away. And those kids, that's why they tear down the pictures of our hostages. What's the solution? So the solution, and this is my call to action to you. The solution, my friends, is to understand that we missed the opportunity to build the, the real bridges that were needed to build, to be built with the 70%. You do that when you're not in crisis mode. When you're not in crisis mode, you work with the 70%. That was my career mission. That's what I've done my whole career. Those of you who know me, that's what Brand Israel is all about. Working with the people that are potential to grow. And I always said, don't bother with the Noam Chomsky's of the world. But when the Noam Chomsky's of the world talk about the elimination of the state of Israel post October 7th, when they had no doubt that Germany had the right to exist, no one said after the Holocaust, after World War II ended, when German was, Germany was completely destroyed, you know that in Germany they referred to the first day after the war as day zero. Germany was completely destroyed, but no one in the world thought that it was legitimate to say that Germany has no right to exist. Japan was nuked by the United States. Over 240,000 people died. Japan was completely decimated, devastated. A militaristic, violent culture reemerged as pacifist culture. By the hands of the Americans. No one imagined, no one dared to say that Japan has no right to exist. But in Israel's case, it's the bon ton. Everybody says, oh, President Obama, he's sitting there five days ago saying, ah, we're all, you know, it's, all our, it's our fault. We're all to be blamed. Really? Would you accept that statement after 9-11? Would you have accepted me standing here in front of you on September 12, 2001, telling you, you know what, Al-Qaeda, what they did, horrible. But let's be honest, you had it coming. Let's be honest. What do you think, that you can live like this with brand new cars? And no one is paying for it? Of course. The poor people of the Middle East are paying for it. The poor people of Africa are paying for it. What are you? Are you surprised that they're attacking you? Let's be honest. We brought it upon ourselves. It's our fault. We are to be blamed for 9-11. My friends, it's the same logic. I was in New York during 9-11. I remember how we looked at the pictures of the people that they thought were missing. But obviously they all died in the buildings. Can you imagine an NYU student walking to that board of sacred pictures, tearing them down in the name of Al-Qaeda? Can you imagine such a scenario? Would that student even be, will survive five minutes after that? But not in the case of the Jews. You're going to have here, next week, the editor of Tablet Magazine that published an article called Vanishing. It's an article every Jew in America must read. It's an article that describes empirically what has happened to the Jews of America since the introduction of the social justice movement and more forcefully since the emergence of Black Lives Matter and George Floyd. In 
Psychology, we call it overcompensation, overcorrection. The American system feels that it had wronged a certain sector, and in an effort to fix the problem, in the name of inclusion, they exclude the Jews. And there's a new kind of anti-Semitism, whereas in the old days, we were viewed as the evil other. The Jews were always accused throughout history of trying to dominate the world. But this time, we represent the establishment. For the first time in history, we're not the other. We are it. The Jews are the establishment. The Jews are white, rich, and therefore wrong. And if you are a member of any minority and poor, by definition, you are right. That's the new dichotomy. That's the new binary vision of reality. So what's the solution, my friends? Be fearless, vigilant, and aggressive. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to take action. Don't be afraid to target. I call it name, shame, and pursue. The people that express poor Hamas views on campus, off campus, in the workplace, there are several Jewish organizations which I will be happy to connect you with that are monitoring these people and are making sure that they're going to be fired. Russell Wickford shouldn't be able to show his face in public from now until the rest of his life. And it is our job as a community to make sure it happens. To make sure that Dana Diab, MD, from Lenox Hill Hospital, a medical doctor at the ER who celebrated the massacre of children on October 7th, a medical doctor. She will never find a job again in her life, not even as a waitress in a, in a restaurant, not that there's anything wrong with being a waitress. But it's important to teach them a lesson. And I say this because I know how reluctant sometimes members of the community are. Maybe not this community. But I know how reluctant people are. They say, come on, you know, let's be thoughtful. Let's... No, no, my friends, this is a new level of pre-civilizational behavior. This is a biblical level event. This event will be remembered a thousand years from now. And this cannot go this is not just another event. This is not an event that you can say, oh, you know what, there are two sides here. No, there are no two sides. There cannot be two sides. There's only one side here, and that's called humanity. Either you, you are on the side of humanity or not. And Russell Rickford has no right to, to be a member of our civilization. If he's exhilarated by the massacre of babies, if that's what makes him happy. And it is our job to make sure it happens. And this is really my message to you, a call to action. And at this point, Rabbi, I think I exceeded my 20 minutes, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to engage in a conversation. Yeah, I'll hold it. You know, thank you so much. Let's start at the very beginning with October 7th. I've spent in my life, uh, well over a year of my life, perhaps close to two years, in the state of Israel. And I have enjoyed a notion of safety and security that I thought was given by the amount of soldiers and IDF bases and everything that we've been so proud of. How did October 7th, how did the surprise of October 7th happen? So, you know, we don't have all the answers right now, uh, but we have some of the, the answers. So several things happened. 
But let me say on a you know, big picture, there was over-reliance on intelligence. There was a transition in the last 25 years from what we call human to SIGINT. Human is intelligence collected from humans, and you need traditional spy work to do that. And SIGINT is intelligence collected by signal source, meaning electronically. And SIGINT is cheaper and safer. You don't have to risk the lives of people. And so countries, including the United States, they become addicted to signal-based intelligence. That's what happened to us. We just fell in love with technology. And we fell in love with the idea that we can collect intelligence without risking lives of agents in the field, and which is something that you're always concerned with. And so I think that, that was big picture, the main reason for what happened. Now, of course, there were not enough soldiers in that part of the country on the morning of October 7th, and this will have to be investigated. Where were the infantry? Where were the armored vehicles? Where were the Air Force? Why weren't they in the South? Uh, we don't have the answer to those questions yet. Uh, there's some speculation that they were sent to the West Bank for political reasons. This will be investigated. This will be investigated. But I, I, as I said before, surpri military surprises like this happen from time to time. It's very sad. Look, Oklahoma City bombing. Do you remember Timothy McVeigh? It was a big surprise. 160-some people died that day. It was a big surprise. No one knew about it. So things like that happen sometimes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's good to see you since 1994. Um, I was the one who invited you. And uh, you've done well since then, so myself too. In 1994, I had full hair. Me, me too. <laughs> um, I think you're exactly right. I think this event was cataclysmic, and I think it's going to change everything. From my conversations with friends in Israel, at this moment, the country is in a deep sense of despair and depression, and what's keeping them out of it is that everyone's out there picking olives and avocados. They're all working. They're all helping. There is tremendous volunteerism. But there's going to have a lasting effect. In the very same way that 9-11 had a lasting effect on American culture, so I want to ask you to be a prophet for a minute. It's almost Hanukkah. I want you to think about Hanukkah next year. Hanukkah 2024. Tell us about Israel, Hanukkah 2024. Who its government's going to be, what its government's going to be like, what issues we'll be dealing with, what its economy will be like, what its diplomacy will be like, and what the matzav ruach, what the attitude, the sense of the country will be like one year from now. So it's a, um, it's a complex question. So I would say it's going to be a combination of plus and minus. The, on the plus side, as you said, the great spirit of solidarity and camaraderie and everybody's volunteering, and there's a great sense of optimism. And you know the soldiers, the young soldiers, the reservists are happy to go to the army. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it. You know, people were coming back from all over the world. We didn't have that in 73. People came back in 73, but this time it was just incredible. Every young Israeli came from India. From... So that on the positive side. On the negative side is that there's always a danger that such an event will turn the Israeli society, which to begin with, you know, as Amos Oz used to say when he was asked to describe the Israeli psyche, he used to say, we the Israelis... We fight the Arabs during the days, and during the nights, we fight the Nazis. Meaning the Nazis are still haunting us in our dreams. And so it happened to the most sensitive nation in the world. October 7th happened to the one group of people that where the trauma of the Holocaust is still fresh in their collective psyche. So this could only have one impact, which is very negative. And that is that Israel will become far more militaristic and militant as a result of October 7. Less desire to trust any other country, let alone the Palestinians. And 
believing that there is a military solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which obviously there is not. The solution can only be diplomatic. And so that's the danger. Now, practically, you ask me what's going to happen next Hanukkah. I believe that I don't, I don't see how Mr. Netanyahu survives this conflict. Uh, I think that Mr. Gantz joined the government in order to be able to leave the government, realizing that once he will decide when to leave, that will be the end of the military phase and the beginning of the political phase. So Benny Gantz, just by virtue of joining the government, became the most important person in the Israeli political system. Because once he decides to break the pact with Netanyahu, that's the, the beginning of the end of Netanyahu. I believe that Benny Gantz will be the next prime minister, according to all the surveys. He's leading by far the most popular Israeli politician. And the reason he, was so pop he is so popular is he's not divisive. He is a very inclusive, uh, kind person. He may not be the most gifted politician, but he's very much like, um, um, like Biden in many ways. He's like, like a, he's a nice guy. You know, there's nothing bad about him. He's not, he's not vicious. And, um, and, and, and you see, uh, you know, what happened to Mr. Netanyahu. I don't know, you can't even use the word tragic. It's beyond tragic. It's like the, the, the biggest calamity in the history of the Jewish people. What happened to him? Like how he cultivated this Hamas doctrine that somehow cultivating this deadly organization was better than working with the Palestinian Authority. And it claimed the lives of 14 innocent Israelis, 1,400 innocent Israelis. This is something that he will have to live with. And history, he will be remembered in history only by that, nothing else. And, um, and this is what's going to happen. So if you ask me how Israel will be a year from now with the new government, I'm assuming. I'm assuming the prime minister will be Benny Gantz. And I think he will be a good prime minister um, because he has a good heart and he's the kind of healer, not a divider. And he's a unifier. And that's why I think he will be a good prime minister. Israel will begin quick recovery. We always recovered very quickly from every bombing, every bus that was exploded, every restaurant, very quickly. And what you will see is tremendous economic growth in the next 10 years. Because you have to understand, the Israeli government will pour in tens of billions of dollars to rebuild the South. Again, just like 9-11, you had to rebuild Lower Manhattan. Remember what they did wisely. They did not decide to build again the Twin Towers. Instead of building the Twin Towers, they decided, which is also part of the healing trauma, you have to start anew. They, built, they rebuilt something completely different. That's what's going to happen in the Israeli South. They will destroy all those communities and build something completely new. And that will fuel Israeli economy. So uh, I'm very optimistic about the long-term future. It involves a great deal of growth. But I'm afraid that politically what will happen is that the society will be more and more radicalized by October 7th. So let me ask you two follow-ups to go this with. You mentioned one of them. Israeli Arabs did not rise up during this time. They, they did in the last iteration. And on the West Bank, although there's more violence on the West Bank, it's not an intifada. So help us understand what are Israeli Arabs thinking today, and it's the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, and what's the future of the West Bank? Abbas is 88 years old. Someday the Kodesh Baruch Hu is going to decide his time is up, uh, or someone else will decide. What's the future of the West Bank? So a survey conducted by the Hebrew University indicates that 70% of the nearly 2 million Israeli Arabs vehemently oppose Hamas and support what Israel is doing, 72%. And the answer is why. The question is why. The answer is this. It's a combination of several things. The first is that this is... Um, um, the first time that WhatsApp groups shared very quickly images of the atrocities. Some of the images, and I had the misfortune of watching two and a half hours of all the images that were collected. We collected 50,000 video files 
from public cameras and GoPros that the terrorists themselves documented. In some cases, they used the social media accounts of the victims to document. And I had to watch the whole thing because I said to myself, I'm not going to go on a speaking tour without watching this video. And let me tell you, it's the worst thing I've seen in my life, and I've been to combat. I've been to combat in Lebanon in June of 1982 until mid-August. I was in the first phase of the first Lebanon war. And then, of course, I was in Lebanon later. So that's the first reason. In those videos, you see how they torture and mutilate and murder Israeli Arabs and Bedouins. 44 victims were Israeli Arabs. Why? They made, most of them worked in the music festival. Because Jews don't want to work on the Sabbath. So you take someone who's not Jewish to work. So most of the workers in the festival were Arabs. So that's the first reason. Second reason is the response of, of Mahmoud Abbas, known as Abu Mazen. Abu Mazen may be 88 years old, but he committed himself to nonviolence. Mahmoud Abbas does not support violent resistance to Israel. That's a fact. That, that's another thing that will be investigated. When Mr. Netanyahu cultivated the Hamas doctrine, he had a leader who was committed to nonviolence. What did you do with that opportunity? He will be asked. You preferred an organization that has in its charter the annihilation of the state of Israel and the killing of all Jews? You preferred them over this guy? Explain why. And why did you allow hundreds of millions of dollars to go from Qatar to Hamas? Explain why you did that. For 15 years, not for one year, 15 years. So the reaction of Mahmoud Abbas, who did not express sympathy with Israel, but certainly did not express support for Hamas. Because remember, they're bitter rivals. You, most of you don't know. But the brutality that Hamas displayed against Israelis on October 7th, is not unique in the Muslim world. ISIS displayed the same level of brutality against Al-Qaeda. I remember when I was a diplomat, and you used to have a joke. I used to ask my American audiences, ISIS is killing Al-Qaeda. Who do you favor? Ariel Sharon used to say jokingly, I wish much success to both sides. <laughs> They displayed the same level of brutality against Fatah in 2007 when they kicked them out of Gaza. They mutilated their bodies. And this was again recorded and documented. In this case, they did so gleefully, joyfully. They were having fun. Even the Nazis were trying to hide their crimes. You don't see a film of the Jews dying in the gas chambers because the Nazis did not document the actual death of Jews in the gas chambers. But they did. And they celebrated it. In one of the videos, and again, I don't want to share with you too, too much of the, you know what, I'll, I'll use a different example. A phone call. So we have this audio file of a Hamas terrorist who's calling his parents using the phone of one of his victims. And he's bragging about the fact that he killed 10 Jews and he's telling his parents, be proud of your son. I have their blood on my hands. I'm a hero, he says to them. I killed 10 Jews. It doesn't say I killed 10 Israelis. 10 Jews. Also people that associated themselves with Jews. For example, Thai workers, workers from Thailand, were killed and their bodies were mutilated because they worked for the Jews. Right? So that's guilt by association. So that's, I think, a combination of reasons why the Arabs understand that this is different. And lastly, I will say that the biggest fear among rank-and-file Palestinians, when I say rank-and-file Palestinians, I mean 
Palestinians that are not interested in politics and the Palestinians that want to live in peace, want to have normal life. Believe it or not, the vast majority of the Palestinians are like that. They just want to have, to live life. I know that because I, I, before October 7, I dealt with Palestinians every day in the West Bank, every day. And the, um, the reason why those Palestinians feel that way, because they fear that Hamas murdered for good the national aspirations of the Palestinian people. And, and I think that to a large degree that's exactly what's going to happen at least for the next generation or two. Can I challenge you for a moment? Please. This is what we do for fun as Jews. Can I challenge you? I've been saying for the last two weeks that I think in the coming months we'll find Jews who are October 8th Jews and Jews who are October 6th Jews. It's hard for most Jews to live in October 8th. So there'll be a, an instinct to pull back, to believe that we can go back to the way that it was. And I actually am fearful that the instinct will be to push Israel back to October 6th also. The instinct will be to say, when we look at our international playbook of, I'm sitting in front of an Aaron Kodesh, so baloney, the best play that we have is two-state solution. So because we have to choose between murderers and rapists and people who eat candy and dance during murder and rape, we'll choose the dancers because those are people that we should make peace with. But if we lived through October 7th and we paid attention to the Palestinian representative in the United Nations making the case for Hamas, if we read Abu Mazen has never once said that there should be a Jewish state next to a Palestinian state, never once. Right. If we actually read with our eyes open, as opposed to the way that we lived our lives before October 7th, then perhaps there isn't a play yet. It, there's nothing that has worked and there's nothing worthy of revisiting. And for the first time in a long time, that's the anxiety that maybe global leaders feel when they speak about this. Their instinct is to go back, but as a Jewish people, is it our responsibility to start telling people that actually there is no going back? There might be something new eventually, but right now we know that in fact, right. the, so, the aspiration of an Oslo type two state solution is Gamor. Yeah, so in, I totally understand what you're saying and I agree with you. We are in a moment known in social anthropology as the threshold moment. What is a threshold moment? It's when you, there's a moment when you enter the room, when you're not in the room yet, but you're not outside of the room yet. A social ritual, like weddings, are a threshold moment. What is a wedding? The actual wedding itself, you're not married yet, but you're not, not single anymore, right? It's a threshold moment. We are in that moment. We don't know how this is going to evolve. We know that we will never be able to go back to October 6th. You're absolutely correct. This will never be the, again. And maybe the two-state solution is murdered for good. But October 8th may produce a more creative solution that right now we don't see. For example, a very sophisticated system of demilitarization of both the West Bank and Gaza with civilian autonomy, for example, um, which uh, is something that Menachem Begin talked about when he tried to introduce the idea to the Egyptians in the 1970s. That's right. The autonomy, he spoke about autonomy. So who knows? They can come up with some creative ideas that we can't think about right now because we are in that threshold moment and things are not clear yet. 
Um, and many things have to fall into place before we even begin to design the future. But I totally agree with you. There's a very good chance that the possibilities that were entertained in the past are no longer on the table. In fact, there's an article today, and I don't know if it was tr translated into English, but I think it's, a, it's in Ynet, it's probably in English. Look it up by Chuck Freilich. Chuck Freilich is a former Mossad guy, and he's a dear friend of mine, and he used to teach with me at NYU, and he wrote a piece that basically says that what you're saying, Rabbi, that the two-state solution is dead for good. And, and that there'll, there'll be no other option for the Palestinians for the next 50 years to 100 years. That's what basically what the article is saying. It's a pretty doomsday scenario for the Palestinians, but certainly there's a possibility that Chuck Freilich is correct. And, but we don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. We'll have to wait and see. And remember, we have to be patient. There are no easy fixes. First, we need Israel to neutralize Hamas military capabilities. That's the first condition. And then, once that happens, we can begin the design process of the future. Let me ask you a creative question, just as a follow-up, because this summer, I had the honor of being invited as part of a group of leaders that make up this organization, Zionist Rabbinic Coalition. We traveled to Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Bahrain, Jerusalem. It was in a closed meeting in one of these places that was not Jerusalem, where it's first said to us that perhaps the Palestinians are incapable of self-governing. But the promise of the Emiratis, of the Bahrainians, of Riyadh, of all of these other people coming together to form some kind of federation of responsibility was right around the corner. October 7th comes as a stake in the ground that Israel and Riyadh, Jerusalem and Riyadh will not stand together. Do you think that we can move past this back to an Israel-Saudi agreement? Yes. Yeah, the answer is absolutely yes, and I'll, say, and I'll explain why. For Saudi Arabia, a, a deal with Israel is part of a much larger strategy. They need to transition their economy, just as the Emirates, by the way, from a, a, a resource-based economy, meaning natural resources like oil economy, to knowledge-based economy. The only partners they have in the world for this transition are the United States and Israel. Israel, in its own little part of the world, has a really punch way above its weight in terms of knowledge production. Israel today, Israeli universities are ranked in the top of, of the world. We have uh, six representatives, six Israeli universities are ranked consistently in the top 200 universities in the world. This is an unbelievable achievement. And so Israel is a, is a major producer of knowledge and the Saudis want this relationship. And if you noticed, they haven't said much since October 7th. And if you noticed, the Emiratis issued a release that was very similar to the European response. So the Gulf countries, um, you know, they are the epitome of Palestinian isolation in the Arab world today. And let's face it, again, Hamas did what they did out of weakness, not out of strength. They did what they did as a cry for help. They did what they did because they understood that an Israeli-Saudi deal will be the, the kiss of death for the Palestinians. They were sidelined and marginalized by their own doing, by the way. It wasn't us who marginalized them. They marginalized themselves by rejecting every territorial compromise that was ever offered to them. Uh, nevertheless, that's what happened. Uh, in uh, international relations and political science, there is the concept known as the concept of the power of the weak. Weak actors in the international arena can allow, can al allow themselves to do things that strong countries cannot do. And that's the case 
of non-state actors like Hamas and Hezbollah and others. They can do things that institutional states cannot do. And that's called the weak, the power of the weak. And, um, and, and that's, that's what we're seeing. But I, I totally agree with you. I think that you're correct. And, um, and the Saudi deal um, will happen. Just remember this, in the Middle East, when you use the term peace, usually we are referring to some form of non-belligerency. It's not really peace that we're talking about in the Middle East. It's never what you're having with Canada. It's going to be more like what you used to have with Cuba. All right? So when people say peace in the Middle East, it's really the avoidance of war. That's the meaning of peace in the Middle East. Because, you know, we signed the deal with Egypt decades ago, and we still don't have normal relations with them. Why didn't Hezbollah launch 150,000 rockets at Israel? So the, we don't know why. It's a good question. One answer is, one speculation is, because Hamas kept them out of the loop, believe it or not. So we all think that they were all coordinated. It turns out, and this is based on an analysis of uh, Nasrallah's speech, that he was surprised also on October 7th. He was caught by surprise as well. So that's one explanation. The other explanation is American deterrence. Deterrence is actually a psychological phenomenon. What is deterrence? Deterrence is based on expectation and our assessments of expectation. So for example, let me give you an example. Let's say I feel that someone had wronged me and I want to sue them, right? But if you will tell me, Ido, listen, this person you want to sue actually is a multi-gazillionaire, then that's a deterrent because my expectation is that if I will sue this person and I may aggravate this person, he then may use his financial leverage to destroy me. So I will never sue them, although I feel that I've been wronged by that person. Same thing between nations. So what's the deterrent here? Hezbollah, at the end of the day, is backed by Iran. Iran only. Remember, Iran is acting out of weakness, not out of strength. They're isolated even within the Muslim world. So Hezbollah all of a sudden finds itself facing massive American military presence that was deployed to the Middle East very quickly. And an American president who breaks, not breaks, creates a new precedent, never happened before in the history of the United States, that the American president shows up in the war-torn situation 10 days after the war breaks out. Unprecedented, never happened. So Hezbollah said to himself, wait a second, what do I need to get myself into this? What for? For Hamas? What they have done for me? So I think that's the second explanation. The third explanation, and, and I say this with grave concern, and I, and I hope that this will be over quickly. If there's one thing that we learned from October 7th is that we cannot allow another Islamist fundamentalist, radical group to develop military capacity along the border. And which means that Hamas will be taken out, and immediately after Hamas is taken out, Hezbollah will have to be taken out. Israel will have to take take out Hezbollah. There's There's no question about it. If this will not happen, then we have learned nothing from October 7th. It's as simple as that. And so, what is more likely to happen, if Hezbollah joins the fight now, then Israel will take them out now. But if they don't, you will wake up one day, a few months from now, and you will see that Israel unleashed the biggest airstrike in the history of the world on southern Lebanon, using bombs that the United States did not provide us so far, 
that are capable of destroying underground facilities. That's what's going to happen. There's no doubt in my mind. If this will not happen, I will resign from the job I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure that it will happen. By the way, a spoiler, Benny Gantz already said it yesterday. But I said it before. I have, I have witnesses in Chicago. I had a big community event. I said it a week ago in Chicago, and I promised them. And then Benny Gantz stole my line. Let me ask you about the hostages. My own family, we, have, we know somebody who's being held in Gaza. We have close friends whose aunt is being held in Gaza. There isn't anybody in the Jewish world who doesn't know a family affected, who hasn't met a family, who hasn't seen someone speak on TV, a Jewish mother, a Jewish sister, brother. Here in our prayer space, we cover one of the seats on our bima with the Israeli flag so that everybody who walks in on Shabbos morning knows that there's somebody missing, that there's a piece of our people torn apart. What is the real expectation inside of Israel? Is the real expectation that once we get down into the tunnels, we'll find 240 people sitting in a room together? Is the real expectation that we'll have 50 or 70 released at some point because the pressure is too much for Hamas? There'll be a five-day ceasefire that was written today in the Haaretz and Jerusalem Post as a story that was floated. These ceasefire attempts, they're going to be 50 at a time, they'll be released. What is the real expectation inside of Israel? So it's a very important issue. So first of all, I believe that this was part of the motivation for Biden to come to Israel, is to remind the Israelis that for a moment, forgot that this is a hostage crisis first, before anything else. Because you have 240 people, over 30 children, you have tens of Americans, tens of Germans, and French, and British, and Thai, and it's an international crisis, not just an Israeli crisis. So Biden came to remind the Israeli government, don't forget, it's a crisis, hostage crisis first. The expectation in Israel is to see all of them back. They're not being held together, we know that for sure. And how do we know that? Because the attack had two phases. The first phase was what we call the institutional professional phase. The commando units of Hamas, the Nukba forces, penetrated, and they inflicted most of the harm. They killed most of the people. And they came with 3,000 rifles in reserves and tens of thousands of bullets in reserves. Their plan was to kill between 10 to 20,000 Israelis. And they wanted to go all the way up to north to Kiryat Gat. So the, the second wave, and they took many hostages in the first wave, but the second wave was thousands and thousands of Palestinians. We're talking about three, 4,000 Palestinians that penetrated Gaza, some from Gaza. Some of them were armed, but they were not trained people. They were not part of the Nukba forces. They were just Gazans. Most of them came to steal things, to loot. And many of them just abducted people, especially the elderly and the helpless. Some of them even abducted people without being armed. They didn't have weapons. They just grabbed all people, put them on a truck, and drove them into Gaza. And they took them as property, as leverage. And they're keeping them in their private homes. So how did we, for, for example, how did we find out where Ori Megiddish was? One of the Palestinians that were captured told us, I heard that she's being held by this and this family. And so we sent a commando unit and brought, got her out. But now we have the hostages spread around. We don't know exactly where they are. And honestly, we don't even know how many exactly. We think it's 239. We're not sure. Because we still have about 50 people unaccounted for. They could be hostages, or they can be dead. Vivian Silver from Winnipeg, Canada. We thought that she was a hostage. Turns out that she died. 
By the way, one of the most tragic stories talking about murdering peace aspirations. This woman was a peace activist. She used to, she had an organization that used to take Gazans, hospital patients, mostly cancer patients, to be treated in Israeli hospitals. She supported peace. Her son is calling for a ceasefire now, right? That's, I mean, it's crazy. They murdered her. She was, she was their best friend in all of Israel. They killed her. So it's so easy to lose hope when you hear stories like that, right? So, um, regarding what's going to happen with the hostages, here is my scenario, and this is what Israelis would like to see. Remember what's happening in Gaza right now. The, Gaza, the Hamas folks are in the tunnels. They're underground. We know they're not controlling above ground because there is a mass migration of Gazans from the north to the south, which is something that Hamas traditionally never allowed. The fact that it's happening is telling us Hamas is not controlling the situation. So they're in the tunnels. So think about it. They have enough supplies for two, three months. Let's assume Israel has the leeway to maintain the siege over northern Gaza for six months. What do you think is going to happen? The last drop of water in the tunnels will go to the hostages first because the hostages then become the leverage, the key to freedom. So the only scenario that where we see all the, scenario, all the hostages coming back home alive is the continuation of the siege and the refusal of Israel to accept the calls for ceasefire because ceasefire will serve only Hamas and will endanger the lives of the hostages. So the only option for Israel is to continue with the siege and to find a way to cut the supplies, to stop electricity, stop energy, and do whatever we can to create the worst conditions in the tunnels. And the sooner we do that, the better it is for the hostages to get out of there. Because they will be the ticket of Hamas out of the tunnels alive. That's the scenario. And I think that the IDF thinks that way. Uh, from my analysis of what's happening on the ground, that's exactly what they're trying to do. My impression is, by the way, that, and, and I said it in the other room before, I'm, I'm deeply impressed with the performance of the IDF, and my impression is that they're the ones who are really running the show, not the Israeli politicians. The Israeli politicians, most of them are no show. And it's the army that is running the show, and the army is doing a great job on the ground. Uh, we, who have a deep sense of connection, alternate between being terribly sad, incredibly angry, awfully anxious and fearful, and most of all, helpless. And out of our helplessness, we do all we flail about. We try to do something. The most beautiful thing was yesterday, 300,000 American Jews gathered in front of the Capitol. Biggest Jewish demonstration, pro-Israel demonstration in American history. All the members of Congress, so many important personalities showed up. Tell us three smart things we can be doing now, we American Jews. So the most important thing that you can do is to make Israelis feel that they're not alone. And that is as simple as connecting with people that you know. I can tell you that even in our own family, there was a moment where the Israeli side of our family felt totally abandoned. And there was a great deal of anger because we felt that some of our relatives in America um, don't understand how we feel. And the silence was def deafening and, and was, um, was hurtful. And so there was a, a moment of, of big, real pain in our own family. Um, when we felt that, uh, and I have to tell you again, I'm, I'm sitting here and I feel very comfortable because I know I'm 
addressing a bunch of people who are staunch Zionists and they love Israel and they're connected to Israel. But I had a meeting only two days ago in, a, in a, an investment bank in New York with Jews who are less connected than you to Israel. And I heard entirely different things. And they're more like the, eh, well, you know, there are two sides to this issue. We need to contain the other side. We need to understand the context. Let's be thoughtful here. And I heard it from prominent Jews in Manhattan. And you will hear it from John Stewart and people like that. If you want to feel good, listen to Bill Maher. But if you want to get angry, you know, listen to other people. But my point is, the first thing is reach out. Most important thing. Reach out to Israelis that you know, and I know that you've been doing it, and it's, it's just the right thing to do. It's the human thing to do. Make them, and again, Obama, um, Biden became a rock star at the age of 81 because he simply said to the Israelis, you're not alone. It's such an important, simple sentence, but such an important statement. You're not alone. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as I said before here, and I say it not because I'm an aggressive Israeli, and I know we, the Israelis, have this you know, image of being aggressive. And those of you who know me, you know that I'm not aggressive. We must punish the anti-Semites. It is an important thing. It's critically important. Because, again, remember, deterrence is all about psychology. We cannot, the days of the Jews in America feeling powerless and defenseless are over. We are powerful. Learn from Bill Ackman. And I told again in the other room, Bill Ackman sent a letter to the president of uh, Harvard. In my, you know, I think the letter was too soft. I think he should have called for her resignation immediately. But I set that aside. But then he did something else. He demanded to see the list of all the students who are members in the 34 campus groups that called for the annihilation of the state of Israel and supported Hamas. And then this British journalist started collecting the retractions of the students or members of those groups. Because Bill Ackman said, I needed the names to create the database for future employers. If you sign that petition, why would I hire you? If you support a deadly organization like Hamas, I want to make sure that you'll never find a job in your life. So imagine, you invested $80,000 a year to go to Harvard, and then what? You end up waiting on tables? And that scared the students. So they started posting in their social media retractions. And this British journalist collected all of them and created the funniest video you've ever seen because he's quoting their justifications and law students claiming they had no idea that they were even members of that association on campus. <laughs> you had students making all sorts of excuses all of a sudden. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to know that this is effective. So this is the second thing that you can do. Be vigilant. Be aggressive. And, don't, and be fearless. Don't be afraid to punish them. And support those groups who do that. Right now, the New York Post is our biggest ally in this effort to identify the criminals. These are criminals. Don't make any mistake. This is, these are not legitimate opinions. That's my point. It's not legitimate to say on September 12, 2001, that Al-Qaeda had a point. It's not legitimate. In the same way, it is not legitimate to say Hamas had a point. It's very important to understand that. So that's the second thing you can do. And the third thing that you can do is to be smart givers. What do I say smart givers? You know, there was a moment where everybody was buying ceramic vests for the Israeli soldiers and helmets and whatever, all the things they, they didn't need. That was not a smart 
giving move because those things are regulated by the Israeli army. And if you buy military equipment and you will ship it to Israel, it's just a waste of money. And the soldiers will never get it because this is all regulated by the army. However, and as I mentioned before, we have here people from the Wounded Soldiers Organization. We have here people from the Jewish National Fund. We have people from American Friends of Tel Aviv University. Now, you know, Tel Aviv University made a decision to waive the tuition of all the students that were called. We have 6,000 students in the army. So imagine it's 14,000 shekels a year per student, including my son, um, and that's a lot of money. That's smart giving. So if you're planning on doing some giving, give the money to where, you know, give the money in, in the most impactful fashion, whether it's wounded soldiers or, or students or the blood bank. Here's an example. Michael Bloomberg said on October 7th that for every dollar that will be donated, he will match. So I got a call on October 8th from two billionaires in New York. I'll tell you who they were. One is a Greek billionaire that I represent in Israel. His name is George Logotetis, who told me, you know, I'm sending a $250,000 check. Tell me to whom. So I immediately told him so that Michael Bloomberg will match it. So now they, we got 500000 because Michael Bloomberg matched it. And then Kenneth Fisher, who's a big real estate guy in New York from the Fisher Brothers Company, one of the biggest real estate companies. Kenneth Fisher is very involved with the military, with the US military, and his family established the Intrepid Museum. If you know the Intrepid, it was built by the Fisher family. And after 9-11, that's how I know Kenneth Fisher, um, the Fisher family established a fund for the families of US military fatalities. Every family that lost a loved one is getting a stipend from the Fisher family. They also created the Fisher House, 60 facilities throughout the United States to treat PTSD. And in Israel, they work with an Israeli organization called Natal, which is dealing with PTSD, founded by Yudit Rekanati. So again, he called me up, said, Ido, I'm sending half a million dollars. Uh, where should it go? So I told him, Work with, you know, the things that you do best, which is PTSD, smart giving. And, and uh, so, uh, by the way, Michael Bloomberg ended up, by the end of the, that campaign, giving $88 million. He can afford it. <laughs> so these are the three things I would recommend. Good. Reach out to Israelis the most humane, fa humane fashion. Punish the anti-Semites and smart giving. You know, I want to thank you for being with us this evening. I want to thank the Howard family for bringing you to us this evening. Uh, on behalf of Eileen Berman, uh, the president of our congregation, the board of directors, uh, it was an incredible honor. And I want, to, I want to just ask you for a favor. It was 29 years between this appearance and your previous appearance at Valley Beth Shalom, perhaps the next appearance we can make it a little bit closer. Is that possible, do you think? With pleasure. Anytime. Okay. Anytime. Sounds great. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Anytime. Thank you all.